thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're excited to resume our schedule of webinars here in 2021. Um, I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum, and uh, it's been my pleasure to host you all on uh, about 40 of these webinars last year. Um, the Victoria did host several also. Uh, we welcome more than 17,000 participants in those webinars, so we're hoping we're off to a great start again uh, this year, technical difficulties uh, notwithstanding. Tonight's speaker is Bruce Gamble. Bruce is a U.S. Navy veteran and prolific author. Uh, he's also becoming a frequent participant in our webinar programs. You'll see that he's actually on the schedule um, so far as it's been announced twice so far this year uh, because we simply couldn't decide which of Bruce's books we actually like best. Bruce has written seven books about the war in the Pacific and uh, they're all awesome, uh, particularly the three about the battle for Rabaul, uh, which will be the end cap to this series of webinars. Uh, Bruce is a Navy veteran, as I mentioned. Uh, he was an electronic reconnaissance officer. Um, and this book that we're talking about today is actually his seventh book. Um, Tonight we'll be talking to Bruce about the Kangaroo Squadron, which was actually, um, you know, kind of the army units active in the South Pacific uh, in the early stages of the war. So, Bruce, uh, with that being said, let's uh, let's not waste any more time on technical difficulties. Have we got you there loud and clear and ready to go? Here I am, and thank you for the opportunity, Keegan. It's really nice to be back here and join you for another webinar. Well, thanks for thanks for joining us, Bruce. Uh, let's let you take it away, and you'll let me know when you're ready to advance the slides. Yeah, there's no title graphic tonight. I just opened this presentation up with a, a big, bold picture of a leather patch from the Kangaroo Squadron, and I'll get into the history of the squadron here as we proceed, but I thought this was a pretty neat visual aid to start with. It's got a, a kangaroo to represent Australia, and he's holding a spyglass in his paws to represent reconnaissance. And his tail is wrapped around a bomb, which represents the other side of the squadron duties in the early part of the war as, as a heavy bomber squadron. Well, let's go on to the next slide, which is a cover image of the book that this presentation is based on. And along with that slide to the side is a Disney cartoon, which is not a World War II vintage cartoon, but actually a modern one. And we'll talk about this cartoon image here of Donald Duck towards the end of the presentation. Go ahead and advance it again, please, Keegan. And people should be looking at an image of an Army biplane. This was, believe it or not, in 1934, the frontline bomber of the U.S. Army Air Corps, a twin-engine biplane with open cockpits, fixed landing gear. It was so slow it could hardly get out of its own way, and uh, it really didn't carry much of a bomb load. But at that time, in the war, in the years between World War One and World War Two, this represented what the Army had for its first line of, of bombers, which is kind of remarkable when you realize how things progress very rapidly from that period of time. Uh, next slide, please, should be a, an image of a couple of Boeing aircraft, also from the 1934 period. In the foreground is a twin-engine B-9. It's actually a prototype. It should say YB-9 to designate a prototype. But this was a, a breakthrough because it has retractable landing gear, and an all-metal fuselage, yet as a throwback, uh, they hadn't quite figured out the technology, yet it still has open cockpits. I mean, it's you look at that, and there's a gun tub right in the nose, and, and then the pilots are behind that, and back on the rear empennage, there's another gun position sticking up. And then a, behind that plane is a Boeing P-26, nicknamed the Pea Shooter, which was the frontline fighter of that period. And it seriously does look like something that Walt Disney would have put in one of his cartoons with those big uh, big uh, pants on the landing gear and, and so forth. And again, an open cockpit. Next slide, please. Incredibly, just one year later, this airplane was in the air. Uh, in 1934, in the spring, the Army put out a competitive bid seeking a long-range bomber 
that can travel approximately 2,000 miles carrying a decent payload and have its own defensive armament. There were a bunch of other parameters that the Army was looking for. And the two primary competitors were Douglas Aircraft and Boeing. In one year, and this is what really is kind of mind boggling, from April of 1934, when the competitive bid went out, to July of 1935, that's only, what, 10, uh, correction, about 15 months. That's all it took for Boeing to put this airplane in the air. Nothing like that could happen these days. I mean, procurement and all things being what they are, it takes years, if not decades, to put a new aircraft in the air for the military. This thing came along in 15 months. So the the transition almost uh, caught everybody by surprise. And so this plane dazzled the public. It, it, it was shiny and huge and had these four motors, which hardly anybody had seen before. And the cockpit was enclosed and it had guns sticking out of all these angles. And a reporter from the uh, a Washington State newspaper in, in Seattle nicknamed it a flying fortress. I mean, he just said it looks like a, a flying fortress and Boeing liked the name so much they actually made it the official name for the airplane. Okay, next slide. By 1941, because of all the uh, war drums going um, in Europe and then war did break out in 1939, by, by 1941, the United States was mobilizing like it had never done before. We had had the 17th ranked Air Force in the world when World War II started, 17th. And within a matter of years, we had the largest, most powerful Air Force in the world, bar none. So that, again, another period of incredible development and rapid transition. So these were some planes on the assembly line at Boeing, lots and lots of them. Uh, Congress appropriated millions and millions and millions, which would equate to trillions nowadays, for Hap Arnold, the chief of the Army Air Forces, to build a world power in, in, uh, in air power. Next slide shows a lineup, and we should be on number seven and showing a lineup of some B-17s on the field at Boeing. These are being uh, basically prepped for the Army to come and uh, acquire them and approve of the, uh, you know, they had to come in and, and make a flight, uh, take, take possession of the airplane, sign a bunch of paperwork, and then fly the plane to whatever bomb group or squadron it was designated to go to. And this picture shows some activity very close to the beginning of World War II as these bombers were being made ready. Next slide, just a little text graphic here about what was happening on the eve of America's participation in World War II as some segments of two reconnaissance, squad, uh, two reconnaissance squadrons, a little hard to spit out there, uh, were ordered to go on permanent deployment for three years to the Philippines. They would be based at Clark Field, not too far from Manila. So on the eve of going overseas, they all gathered at Hamilton Field near San Francisco. And this evolution was so important that the chief of the Army Air Forces, Hap Arnold, flew out in person to talk to the commanding officers and address the officers and men who would be making this deployment. The planes that they put together, uh, originally they were going to be 16, had long range fuel tanks so that they could make the 2,400 mile trip to Hawaii, but the guns were in crates and to save weight, they didn't carry any ammunition for them. So the guns themselves were basically just so much uh, baggage. Next slide. Still on December 6th at Hamilton Field, a quick image of Major Truman Landon, who was the commanding officer of the 38th Reconnaissance Squadron. Uh, he ended up not taking all of his complement of planes, but he did take off on the night of December 6th with two new B-17E models and four somewhat obsolescent C models. And then uh, the other 
planes that left Hamilton Field that night were led by then Captain Richard Carmichael, who's a former pilot of one of those little P6, uh, P, P-26 P shooters that I showed earlier. And he had six new bombers to fly to the Philippines. Their first stop for gas and, and to arm the guns and get ready to go further overseas was going to be Hickam Field in Hawaii. Next slide is a visual graphic showing just the comparisons between the early B-17 Charlie version, they didn't really call it the Charlie, but the B-17C, and the much bigger at the back end E model, which had a huge, comparatively huge vertical stabilizer, a tail gun, uh, more turrets, and these were powered turrets. And you might notice that the turret on the belly of this one is not the conventional ball turret that so many people associate with the B-17. Instead, it was a remotely controlled turret, and the gunner would actually lie on his belly on the floor and manipulate, manipulate these guns using a mirror system. Uh, a lot of these guys got airsick actually trying to do it because they had to reverse everything they were seeing in the mirror to operate these guns. It was a kind of a Rube Goldberg system, uh, not very effective, as you might imagine. Okay, the next slide with the word meanwhile here is, is kind of significant because as the planes were flying over the Pacific from Hamilton Field towards Hawaii, six carriers of uh, Yamamoto's fleet were launching aircraft to hit Pearl Harbor and the Army airfields in Hawaii. So let's go on to the next slide. The planes got scattered as they crossed the Pacific, so they were not in formation. And as dawn broke and they approached Hawaii, they actually encountered some of the early wave of Japanese aircraft coming in to hit Pearl Harbor. In fact, uh, the red circles here show two dive bombers, the Japanese VAL dive bombers, that a photographer happened to capture as he was taking pictures of Hawaii out the side window of his aircraft. Amazingly, the people on board the B-17s thought that the planes they were seeing were sent out to greet them by the Navy or the Army as uh, welcoming aircraft. They had no clue that they were the enemy. The next slide is a map of Oahu. Um, I don't know if you have a pointer available, Keegan, but Hickam Field is down at the southern end of the island. I would also point out to the eastern side, Bellows Field, and then up in the valley between the mountains is Wheeler Field. These are all army fields. Um, and then over on, on a little um, peninsula is Kaneohe Naval Air Station. Uh, at the very north end of the island, you can see what's labeled as the Upana mobile radar site. And this is the famous radar site that detected the Japanese fleet as it was coming in. And a watch officer in the control center um, told the privates who were manning the radar to ignore the incoming uh, signal that he believed it was the B-17s coming in from California. And then just south of that, notice the um, Kahuku label at the north end of the island. That's the site of a golf course. And uh, actually one of the planes that was coming in, one of the B-17s coming in, made a forced landing on that golf course as a result of the Japanese attack. Next slide, please. As for the other planes uh, that came in, of the 12 that came in, two were badly shot up. This one here was the B-17C that made a forced landing at Bellows Field, which is a fighter strip and not long enough to accommodate a heavy bomber. So it overshot the runway, had a couple of wounded people on board and, uh, and they were able to get to medical attention quickly. And the next slide after that, please, shows the other plane that was badly shot up, another B-17C that was hit on its final approach 
in the radio compartment and uh, incendiary bullets from a Japanese Zero set a whole bunch of flares on fire, magnesium flares. Uh, the fire burned very intensely, but luckily the plane was so close to the ground that the pilot and co-pilot were able to set it down just as it broke apart from the fire. And the two pieces slid across the runway. The aft section had a couple of guys on board that went for a wild ride, and the other personnel were able to scramble out of the forward section without too much injury. Unfortunately, one of the passengers happened to be the 38th Squadron's flight surgeon. Well, let's go to the next slide, which shows uh, Lieutenant Schick, who happened to run for it towards a, a hangar after getting out of the airplane, just as a zero came in and scraped the flight line. And a bullet either hit him directly or ricocheted off the pavement and knocked him flat, knocked him unconscious. Either a fragment or a chunk of concrete hit him very hard in the head. And he was taken to the hospital where he was conscious and talking and refused medical attention. He was a doctor. And then later in the night, he died. Apparently, contacting the cement or the impact of the bullet had caused a traumatic brain injury that uh, turned deadly from the fact of, you know, bleeding and brain swelling. So he was the only fatality out of the 12 planes that came in and landed on December 7th. Let's go to the next slide. It's a, a color image of the attack by the Japanese on Clark Field, at basically just a few hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, but because it was on the other side of the international date line, the actual date was December the 8th in the Philippines. And when word really got around that not just Pearl Harbor had been attacked, but multiple sites at the same time, and that we were really truly, you know, being hammered by the Japanese, the orders that those two squadrons had to proceed to the Philippines were immediately uh, rescinded. And go ahead to the next slide, please. Hopefully we're looking at a camouflage B-17. The Hawaiian Air Depot took over the B-17s that had come in from the States and that continued to trickle in over the coming weeks and repainted some of them in a British camouflage scheme. Uh, and the, the B-17s that were, uh, were armed and, and those that were available were sent out every day in multiple directions as long range patrols because everybody assumed that the Japanese still intended to invade. And also there may be submarines out there. So the B-17s of these squadrons spent a lot of weeks just flying long 12 and 14 hour patrol missions way out into the Pacific. Next slide. Should be on slide number 19 if we're all keeping up with each other. In mid-February, uh, correction, early February, uh, Richard Carmichael was promoted to major and given the task of taking a squadron out into the South Pacific to support all the convoys that were being moved to try to get men and equipment and materials towards the scene of the action. And the squadron was actually attached to the U.S. Navy, uh, informally called the Southern Bomber Command. And they put together personnel and planes from a couple of different squadrons, gave this all to Major Carmichael to command, and put together a very loose, um, fluid plan to get everybody out into the South Pacific. So they departed on the 10th of February, island hopped their way to Fiji. We'll see a map of that action here in just a minute. And at Fiji, they paused for a while to support a task force uh, commanded by the USS Lexington that was doing, doing some convoy duty. And then later, uh, while the Lexington was off of Fiji, a lot of the brass put their heads together and came up with a plan to attack Rabaul, which the Japanese had captured 
the previous month. So to kind of put all that into perspective, let's go to the next slide, which shows a broad view of the Pacific Ocean and the region of the Southwest Pacific in particular. Highlighted in blue is what was called the Southern Ferry Route. And it, as I mentioned, island hopped through a couple of options to get people down to Fiji, which had a pretty nice big base run by the New Zealanders. And then from Fiji, planes could hop over to New Caledonia, which was French, and from there go on to the eastern side of Australia. And the other significant thing to point out here is the red dotted line, which shows how much territory the Japanese controlled by early 1942. And you can see how the red dotted line and the blue lines indicating the ferry route seem to converge. I mean, there's still hundreds of miles between them, but we weren't very far from Indian country, as they call it. The next slide shows one of the camouflage B-17s during that Trans-Pacific flight going out towards Fiji, or maybe somewhere taken on a patrol out of Fiji. In the far distance, you can just make out the outline of one of the other B-17. Next slide. This shows the crew and passengers of one of the B-17s immediately after they landed in Townsville in Queensland, Australia. Uh, one person to point out in this bunch is the third guy from the left who's wearing a rather nondescript pair of flying coveralls and, and a simple baseball cap. His name is Frank Bostrom. He was a captain at the time, and he was probably the most awarded, uh, decorated, and famous member of the squadron by the time it wrapped up operations. And we'll talk about him just a little bit more again later on. So let's go on down to the next slide, which shows the control tower at uh, Garbett Field in Townsville. It was a, a pretty well equipped, for, for Australia anyway, a pretty well equipped airfield. Uh, had some nice facilities, and it was uh, had the correct scaping for heavy bombers. That is, the, the runways were improved and had been um, set for you know the, the weight of a heavy bomber. So let's go on to the next graph, the next slide, which is another map, and this shows basically the the route that the USS Lexington took setting itself up for that attack on Rabaul. It was at, in Fiji on February 16th, and then over the next four days moved to the northwest around the Solomon Islands to get into position on February 20th to launch an attack early on the morning of the 21st against Rabaul using its uh, torpedo bombers and dive bombers and so forth, the, the usual complement of a US Navy aircraft carrier in 1942. The next slide shows the plan that was organized for the Southern Bomber Command B-17s to coordinate an attack on Rabaul with the Lexington Air Group. The B-17s were gonna be coming from the bottom part of the map, flying northward from Australia up over the Solomon Sea to attack Rabaul but they wouldn't have enough fuel to get all the way back to Australia. So after the attack, they would fly southwesterly to the uh, Papua New Guinea port of Port Moresby on the far side of a steep mountain range. That's where they would refuel and then return to Australia. In the meantime, you can see a red arrow showing how Task Force 11 and the USS Lexington plan to launch planes from their position, oh, uh, 150 miles or so east of Rabaul and hit the, the harbor and so forth and then fly back to the carrier. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, the task force was discovered by Japanese long-range patrol planes and that attack was called off. Let's go ahead to uh, the next slide which shows 
some crew guys getting ready to load up their equipment and go out for a mission. After the mission was, after the uh, raid by the Lexington was called off, by the way, uh, the Japanese sent a big raid out to attack the Lexington. And that was the circumstance that led to Butch O'Hare becoming the first uh, ace of the U.S. Navy when he downed a bunch of medium bombers trying to torpedo the USS Lexington and was credited with saving the carrier. So O'Hare Field in Chicago was named in his honor for that feat. Uh, so he, here we have on February the 22nd and 23rd, a few days after the planned coordinated attack, uh, Major Carmichael organized uh, just a separate attack by the B-17s. They would plan to take off at midnight thereabouts on February 22nd and fly all night through, uh, oh, five or six hours worth of flight and then attack Rabaul at daybreak on the morning of February 23rd. The next slide shows one of the Southern Bomber Command B-17s. Note again the flat belly turret flying over the mountainous terrain there of New Guinea uh, along the Papuan Peninsula. The mountains were absolutely treacherous. And to this day, there are literally hundreds of Japanese and American wrecked planes scattered among those, those mountains after all of the uh, course of World War II and, and the thousands of sorties flown from airfields in those mountains and, and in New Guinea. The next slide is Fortress Rabaul, uh, a huge harbor. If your graphics are pretty good, you might even be able to see that there are dozens of big ships in the harbor on the, on the right-hand side of the photograph. This was the target. Um, the bombers that took off from Garbage Field on the night of the 22nd got up to, oh, about partway over the Solomon Sea when they ran into a terrible frontal system. I mean, wicked thunderstorms that completely split up the formation. And as it turned out, only five planes made it up to Rabaul. Three of them in one segment led by Major Carmichael and another section of just two planes led by uh, Captain Bill Lewis and pilot Fred Eaton was on his wing. Uh, they uh, went ahead and, and attempted to drop on uh, Rabaul. They had to circle around for quite a while, waiting for some clouds to break. And there's also, believe it or not, steam coming up out of one of the semi-active volcanoes that obscured the harbor. So they orbited around for a while and eventually attracted the attention of the Japanese, which uh, there at Rabaul, uh, a unit known as the 4th Air Group, the 4th Kokotai, sent up uh, a few airplanes. And if you'll go to the next screen, next slide, these were the defenders. Uh, they had a few of a kind of an obsolescent Mitsubishi A5M, and it's kind of remarkably similar to the, the Boeing P-26 P shooter. Uh, these were not their frontline fighter, and they really even weren't nicknamed Claude yet. That didn't come until later in the war. And on the right is the rather ubiquitous Japanese Zero. This was the A6M2 version, the early naval version that was uh, assigned to the 4th Kokutai. And it's worth mentioning that they had highly skilled pilots, many of whom had gained combat experience in China and, and li literally had years of, of experience as combat veterans. So let's go ahead to the next screen. The uh, the planes did come under attack by these zeros, and uh, Fred Eaton will go on to the next slide, please, which shows Fred's airplane. This is uh, the, a side view of the Bureau number ending in 446. Uh, Fred had actually not dropped his bombs on the first run. The bombs held up in their shackles in the bomb bay, and he deliberately circled around for another bomb run, which took 15 to 20 extra minutes. And because of that, uh, the Japanese pretty well swarmed all over him after he did drop his bomb load on the second attempt. So a running gunfight ensued 
that went from the northern tip of New Britain all the way out over the Solomon Sea as they tried to make a dash for it back towards New Guinea. The plane sustained considerable machine gun and cannon fire damage. Miraculously, none of the nine members of the crew received so much as a scratch from machine gun fire or shrapnel or anything. It was it was just kind of unbelievable that for all the bullet holes in the plane, nobody got touched. Unfortunately, the fuel system was either compromised with some leakage or they just used too much fuel during the dash back from Rabal. And incidentally, the plane had hit, been hit twice by large caliber anti-aircraft shells, neither of which detonated. So this plane was living a charmed life and the, the crew survived basically because Eaton was a skilled pilot, find, found a place where he could put the plane down. They did not have enough fuel to make it over those high mountains back to Port Moresby. And so he found what looked like a broad expanse of grass and made a belly landing. Let's go to the next slide, which shows an aerial photograph of that aircraft within days or weeks after it made the belly landing. And what looked like a dry or maybe solid level grassy plain turned out to be a waist deep swamp. And the black streaks in the photo are literally just puddles of water where the bomber sliding through grass just stripped away the grass and the water seeped in creating these black impressions in the photograph. The grass, as it turns out, and we'll see some color examples and close-ups later, grew in the wet season, sometimes 12 to 15 feet high and was razor sharp and it was deceptive. So the plane came in belly, landed with the wheels up, and then immediately settled into waist deep water. Let's go to the next slide. And this is how it looked from overhead when a plane made a flyby sometime after the crew had abandoned the plane. Uh, you can clearly see the water all around the aircraft and the grasses that are just spread out everywhere in every direction. This is the Agiambo Swamp in New Guinea. And it's actually vast. I mean, covering, I don't know exactly, but probably thousands of acres. And let's go on to the next slide to kind of show a graphic of, of the geographic relationship here. Pretty much right in the middle of that map showing New Guinea, you can see the Agiambo Swamp marked and a little image of the B-17 where it's parked about 17 miles inland from the coast. When the guys got out of the airplane, they realized that they were really in serious trouble because there was nothing to be seen pretty much in any direction except for the mountains in the distance. They didn't want to stick around because they were afraid the Japanese might come and bomb the airplane. So they decided that their best bet was to get away from it. They sent out some distress calls, but um, the Radio codes were not accurate, and uh, unfortunately, the the radio crew in Port Moresby only got snippets of the actual information, uh, and the location was was incorrect. So there really wasn't much word anywhere of what had become of this crew. As it turned out, it took them four days to walk out of the swamp, and it almost killed them. They had no food. Uh, they did have some fresh water occasionally from rain, but it didn't last. And uh, they just had to walk through this razor sharp grass and hack their way through with a couple of machetes. And the physical effort, the extreme heat, the lack of food and everything came very, very close to being fatal for them. But on the fourth day, they came out on dry ground and found some. Papua natives from a nearby village who were chopping into a palm tree and scared them unbelievably. They ran into the woods, but gradually uh, crept back out 
uh, they had never seen anything like this. These nine bedraggled, emaciated Americans, white men, uh, but they led them to their nearby village. And from there, uh, the Odyssey really got underway. Uh, word was finally given to an Australian coast watcher who was able to set out and try to search for them and almost miraculously found them in a native village farther downstream from the little river next to the camp where they were first found. This guy, a, a coast watcher named Alan Champion, uh, took the whole crew up to his uh, government station near Buna, way up the coast, fed them for a while, then took them to an Anglican mission where they were fed and treated by some Anglican nurses. Uh, a lot of them had uh, dysentery and malaria and their hands were cut. So it, it took quite a while for them to heal. And in the meantime, Alan Champion got on the radio and tried to arrange for transportation, which wasn't easy to come by. And long story short, these guys either walked or went by boat for hundreds and hundreds of miles over a period of five weeks before they finally made it all the way around the Papuan Peninsula to Port Moresby and arrived at the beginning of April. So from February 23rd to the 1st of April, they were vagabonds and uh, pretty much starving vagabonds at that. That's pretty much the story of, of the Eaton crew. Um, the rest of the squadron's history I have covered very briefly in this uh, textual screen here, which we should be on page 36. Uh, I'll just kind of highlight a few of these. The, Squadron went through a couple of redesignations. It was sent back to the Army eventually as the 14th Reconnaissance Squadron. Some weeks later, they changed the designation to the 40th Reconnaissance Squadron, and then ultimately named it the 435th Bombardment Squadron in the spring of 1942. And the accomplishments of this one group of 12 planes is pretty astonishing considering that they were really the tip of the spear, the only American unit to get overseas so quickly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So not only that first American raid on Rabaul, they operated out of New Guinea as the first American unit to do that, hitting targets in uh, you know, New Britain and around the, the Solomons and all across the Southwest Pacific. I've mentioned some of them there, places like Rabaul and Ley, and other strongholds there. In March, they evacuated General MacArthur and his family from Mindanao. It was a pretty famous rescue. Um, MacArthur had been ordered to evacuate Corregidor, and he took his family and primary staff by PT boat down to Del Monte Field in Mindanao. And two, or yeah, correction, two B-17s finally met him there. And the one that flew out, MacArthur was flown by uh, Frank Bostrom, the man that I pointed out earlier in the presentation. Bostrom was awarded uh, the Distinguished uh, Flying Cross for that, a, a pretty high honor. Um, long range patrols, uh, they flew a lot of those and in fact were sort of elemental in the, uh, the, the beginning of the Coral Sea battle. B-17s flying out of Townsville from this squadron located the Japanese carrier Shoho. In fact, uh, uh, they set it up for destruction. Once they located it, um, planes basically shadowed it until the Navy could come out and hit it during the opening rounds of the Coral Sea battle in May. Uh, there are also some other famous uh, events like a, a big raid on, on the Philippines, Philippine Islands led by General Ralph Royce that included uh, a unit of B-25s and three B-17s. Uh, one of the B-17s was destroyed on the ground at, uh, at De Monte Field, but the rest participated in some of the attacks. And then later, uh, the crews of that same squadron also rescued Filipino President Kazan and his staff, again from Del Monte Field on Mindanao right before 
uh, it fell to the Japanese. Later in the summer of 1942, it was uh, B-17s of the 435th that detected an airfield under construction on Guadalcanal that led to a very rapid change in plans from a, a separate plan to attack other islands to the actual invasion of Guadalcanal that happened in August of 1942. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then throughout the rest of the year, the squadron continued to fly every day that the weather allowed uh, armed reconnaissance. They would carry usually uh, a few bombs, but mainly a lot of gas, and they would go out for long hours at a time just to just keep tabs on the Japanese positions with photographic reconnaissance and and keep tabs on enemy shipping. It was all part of a very well organized intelligence network that was uh, highly effective. The next slide is a graphic. Um, it's a map that shows quite uh, quite dramatically how little territory the Allies had in 1942, at least at the beginning of the year. Those Japanese flags show major airfields and Japanese strongholds all throughout the Southwest Pacific and New Guinea, places like Buna and Ley and Gazmata on New Britain and Rabaul, of course, that being the hub from which all of the other bases received their support, both by ship and by air. But again, I mean, just every island practically had a Japanese facility of some kind, and some of them had pretty big, significant air bases. So there was a lot to keep tabs on. Uh, the enemy was really dug in, and the U.S. accomplished this by flying from pretty much three places as close as they could get to the enemy at Horn Island, which was just kind of a staging base up there at the very tip of Australia mainly out of Port Moresby, and then as a secondary base, they later on invaded and uh, reconfigured some airstrips at Milne Bay in 1942. And these are the areas that the 435th Squadron predominantly operated from all the way up into late October of 1942. As far as battle casualties, there was only one plane shot down from the squadron during the entire tour, it was this plane, which was rather well known because it had been bought and paid for by the citizens and school children of Seattle and the Northwest Pacific. And the Seattle Post Intelligence or newspaper was involved with this. And they named the plane Chief Seattle of the Pacific Northwest, had a lot of publicity surrounding the christening of it. And then on its third combat mission, it was shot down and the crew uh, perished. Only one other crew member, if I uh, recall correctly, was killed in action. He was a tail gunner who happened to just be hit um, by a stray bullet when a Japanese Zero made a, uh, an attack, a gunnery attack, um, from the front. And the bullet actually struck him in the back as he was facing aft manning the tail gun position in a B-17. Uh, he was dead by the time the plane landed and uh, was buried in New Guinea. The next slide that deals, uh, this is really the last slide that deals with the World War II uh, history of the squadron. Just wanted to point out uh, that I actually have a family connection. I'm, I'm not just an interested historian, but actually a family member of uh, one of the participants, my Uncle Johnny, who after this, after he came back from overseas, he married my dad's older sister. And uh, John Steinbinder was a second generation American. Uh, his parents were Hungarian. And he was a navigator on dozens of combat missions with the squadron. I put a red arrow to point out his, uh, his different position in these pictures that on the left on the uh, picture on the upper left. And then in the middle, he's pictured there with an arrow. I want to point out that the man in the center of that uh, picture of, of three guys on the, on the beach is a pilot named John Wallace Fields. And I believe his son, Ken, 
may be uh, joining us here on the webinar tonight live. Uh, hopefully he's listening in. And uh, I'll mention him a little bit more later, along with a couple of other people that, uh, that I invited to join up. So my Uncle Johnny was part of this, and his diary was a real key element in my book, The Kangaroo Squadron. So let's go to the next slide. We're going to have color slides from here on out. This one shows the remains of the bomber still sitting in the Yagyambo Swamp in the early 1970s. It was photographed from the air by some helicopter personnel, uh, Army, uh, Australian Army personnel kind of rediscovered it in the 70s. And this gives you a real good idea of the grass that grows up around it in the swamp. Uh, it gradually acquired a nickname, the Swamp Ghost, because these kunai grasses would grow up so tall in the wet season, they would practically hide the bomber. And then in the dry season, when they shriveled back to, you know, a lot shorter, the plane would be revealed again. And so it would almost appear and disappear and then reappear. And from time to time, people would stumble back across it. So it kind of gained its own mystique, especially with a name like that. Let's go to the next slide. This shows how tall those grasses can grow. I mean, they've completely covered the forward fuselage and even a good portion of the main wing and completely covered the horizontal stabilizers back at the tail. But because the bomber uh, had basically the, the paint had faded off of the bomber, it looked kind of silvery and would reflect the sunlight. So it, it also added a little bit more to the mystique with this kind of this ghostly silver appearance, just kind of popping up out of the jungle. The next slide shows, uh, he's actually an American who is flying over in Australia, uh, flying a little light bell chopper and landed it right on the wing and they were crawling around on the upper fuselage this gives you, again, a, a sense of how tall the grasses are because you, you're looking at a B-17 uh, sitting in the swamp. The grasses go down below the wing several feet, and they're sticking up above the wing probably 12 feet or 10 feet. So kind of gives you an overall idea of how thick and heavy that grass is and gives you an appreciation for how difficult it must have been for Fred Eaton and his crew to walk through that and hack their way through that over those four days when they nearly died. Fast forward in the next slide to around the early, well, this is 2006. A lot of people wanted to acquire that airplane for all kinds of reasons, especially because it was a rare version of the B-17E with that, that flat belly turret. And the man who pulled it off is a friend of mine named Fred Hagen. He's pictured on the right, who also has a family connection. His great uncle, Major Bill Ben, was the aide to General George Kenny, who was the commander of the Fifth Air Force in the Southwest Pacific from 1942 until the end of the war. So as Bill Ben's great nephew, um, Fred got involved in the aircraft recovery business, uh, or I should say, maybe it's a hobby, not a business, but he certainly caught the bug. Um, his uncle had died in a crash in New Guinea. He was, he was among those unfortunates, among those hundreds of planes that crashed into the mountains. His great uncle was one of them, and Fred was able to find the remains of that plane, and later came across the swamp ghost in the Agiambo swamp on a flight, and became determined to recover it and had the means to do so. So to cut to the chase, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, in 19, it correction in 2006, with a team that included Ken Fields, the, the son of the pilot I mentioned uh, already, and, and several other people uh, were able to negotiate with the local villagers and the local tribes to go out uh, and dismantle the airplane. Uh, it took some government permissions and so forth, 
but they were able to, over a period of, uh, I guess, about a month, dismember the plane so that it could be lifted out. There really was no other way to extricate it from the swamp. So the wings were cut off, the engines were cut off. Go on to the next slide. You can see these guys hard at work. Um, they had the foresight to film everything and have made documentaries about it. But it was a, a real um, endurance odyssey for them to be out there in the conditions that they were in, cutting up the airplane, putting airbags underneath it, getting ready to hoist the pieces out. I think something that's significant to point out, and let's please go on to the to the next slide, which shows the plane with pieces separated but not yet lifted out. What's kind of significant is that the first color pictures we saw a little while ago taken in the 70s showed the swamp still pretty much grassy. But in the next 30 years, from the early 70s up into the early first years of, of this century, it's amazing how much undergrowth came up. Uh, apparently the swamp is draining. So if it had looked like that when Fred Eaton flew over it back in 1942, he could not have pulled off that landing. The last slide, uh, I think this is the last slide of the swamp coast in the swamp shows the fairly amazingly good condition that, that it was in, sitting up on airbags ready to have the lift uh, commence. And uh, the next slide shows a Russian heavy lift helicopter that was uh, contracted to come in and, and do the work. Um, this is one of the main wings. You can see all the water pouring out of it. It's stained from 68 something years lying in the swamp. And by the way, the swamp grass, or the swamp water is that color. It's kind of it's been described as being stained like tea because of all the organisms that are decaying in that warm water. After the pieces were lifted out of the swamp, they were put on a barge nearby that was then pushed on up to the port of Ley. And here are the, uh, the pieces have been offloaded on the next slide where at, I think slide 49, the, the fuselage and one main wing are here on, uh, on a jetty. And uh, unfortunately there it stayed for about three more years due to a big fiasco with politics and government issues and some publicity efforts by others to try to prevent the plane from leaving Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is what happened. The, the plane just sat like this, maybe containerized, but still in pieces for three years before Fred Hagen and his group were finally able to negotiate permission to remove the plane, at which point it was put on a container ship and brought to the United States. It sat in California for a few years and then eventually found a hopefully permanent home in the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And if we we'll go to slide number 50, it was temporarily pieced back together outside on a parking ramp um, on cradles to hold all the pieces in their approximate position. And after uh, an assessment, which included cataloging the battle damage and equipment that was still there, and also making note of what had been carted away over the years, uh, this is basically what it looked like. And personally, I believe that Fred's efforts uh, and, and those of his team to get the plane out of the swamp were extremely important because if the plane had stayed there, eventually it would have just disintegrated. Uh, and there's also the threat, seeing how the swamp is draining, uh, that someday that could have just turned into a grassland that uh, would be susceptible to a, a brush fire, which would have destroyed what was left of the airplane. So. Getting the plane out of the swamp uh, didn't make some people happy, but the effort really means that thousands and thousands of people can now see it. It's fairly accessible. 
and we'll go on to the last slide, which shows the Swamp Ghost in Hangar 79 on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor. Uh, incidentally, some of the windows in the hangar still have bullet holes from the Japanese attack on December 7th. And this plane that was not there on December 7th, but certainly was in Hawaii and part of that effort to search for submarines and enemy ships before going overseas. Uh, the fact that it's back where it kind of started out its wartime experiences is, is really significant and, uh, and meaningful. So there is the Swamp Coast as she looks today. And the final slide of the presentation is that Disney graphic that was created by Mike Gabriel, the director of the Disney movie Pocahontas and, and has his hands in many other projects at Disney. Um, he created this image using Donald Duck, which if I, if I have my facts straight is the first uh, actual Disney authorized nose art, if you will, even though it was never painted on the nose, but one of the first authorized ones to be done since World War II. So the fact that Disney felt it was a worthwhile project really says a lot about the plane and about the squadron and about the history and about the story of what a hundred and so or so men went through for months and months when there really wasn't very much out there in the way of support in the beginning months of World War II. Well, that's all I have really for the story of the Kangaroo Squadron and the Swamp Ghost. We've actually run to about an hour now, and I would love to have anybody who's got questions typed in or has any uh, anything that they would like for a follow-up to chime in, and Keegan, I'll turn it back over to you. Bruce, thank you so much for uh, for your time this evening and, and for taking us on that journey. Um, I think it's it's a very interesting point of connection that a lot of us know about the B-17s that were, um, you know, flying inbound to Pearl Harbor the day of the attack. But I think you've helped us fill in an important gap, which is to understand what that unit then went on to do and their contributions to the, the early part of the war as a whole. Um, so we do have uh, a bunch of questions that have been entered in. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with those. But folks, if you do have questions, um, go ahead and enter them into the question window. Uh, we'll do our best to get through all of these while still being as respectful as we can of, of everyone's time. Um, Bruce, you you have your Navy service background and obviously you're, you've written books about Rabaul, uh, but you have this family connection to this story. Um, which, which of these things kind of led you to this story about the Kangaroo Squadron? Was it that family connection or uh, their important role in the early attacks on Rabaul? How, how did you kind of come at this? It, it was my uh, my uncle who got me hooked. I mean, uh, I'd heard about his some of his stories of flying B-17s and and the experiences that he had gone through most of my life, uh, at least that I was, you know, when I was old enough to be aware of of those kinds of things. So I knew of his service, and when I really got into his diary. Uh, years and years later. And unfortunately, it wasn't until after he was not able to contribute more personally due to Alzheimer's. When I got into his diary, I just was astonished at what they went through with no support to speak of. When I mentioned the 12 planes going overseas, they carried, they carried their own mechanics and stuff. I mean, they had to do their own work. So the crew chiefs and the enlisted men did double duty in mechanical work, and the officers pitched in too. I mean, they all helped with loading bombs and loading ammunition and fueling the planes. They, there really wasn't a whole uh, segregation of officers and men there. They were all in that together. I would point out that of the planes that flew into the attack on Pearl Harbor, not all of those planes or crews were included in the unit that went over to Australia a couple of months later. So I do want to point that out. It wasn't a one for one. All the guys who came into the Pearl Harbor attack also went out to Australia with the first group, but a good portion of them were included in the, in the flight out to Australia. 
Bruce, you mentioned that supply lines and, and just maintenance of the aircraft and everything was an everyday nightmare. Was that ultimately resolved or were, you know, were the airplanes taken out of service or returned to the United States ahead of, ahead of ultimately resolving that? Or were we able to eventually ship enough parts to Australia to kind of stage the larger war effort? Uh, parts were a, a, a huge deal. Uh, there was no supply line to speak of. And when they first got to Townsville, with 12 planes, uh, due to circumstances that I really didn't talk about, they were quickly down to just a handful of airplanes. On the night of that first Rebal attack, there was actually a collision on the ground in the darkness between two of the B-17s, and one of them never flew again. It became a cannibal queen and was used to have parts cannibalized off of it to keep other planes in the air. Uh, so that was their routine for quite a long time. There, there was virtually no supply line. Uh, they did have physical help from Australian grounds personnel, but they didn't know anything about how to maintain a B-17. So most of the hands-on work actually had to be done by the crews who were doing double duty. So they had very long days, especially when there was a mission. And as far as as far as keeping the planes in the air, um, some of their early attacks would have, and it sounds like a joke, they might have two or three, maybe sometimes even only one plane would get through to the target. And you think about how that compares with later in the war over Germany when the 8th Air Force and the 15th Air Force were putting thousands of bombers in a single mission over Europe. Uh, these guys were lucky if they would get three or four or five B-17s up for a single mission. With such a small number of airplanes, Bruce, how effective were they really operationally? Um, you know, the, part of the reason that mass bombing efforts were launched later in the war was that was kind of what it took to, to be effective at the mission. Um, B-17s, although they were talked about it in this way at the time, they're not necessarily precision instruments. Uh, what were they really able to achieve uh, on raids against a fortified location like Rabaul uh, with such a small number of airplanes? You bring up an excellent point, and, and the short answer is they weren't effective. They were not effective. Um, the Norden bomb site had this legendary reputation of being able to, you know, they, they claimed they could put a bomb in a pickle barrel. Well, that may be true when you're at 8,000 feet over a stationary target in the desert on a nice day, but flying against uh, enemy interceptors and in bad conditions and from high altitude, it just was not that accurate. Um, back in the day, the conventional wisdom was that B-17s could bomb naval targets, and that was disproved many times during the early months of the war. They just they couldn't hit anything. The bombs would be falling. A Japanese captain could literally look up and see the bombs coming down and steer out of their way. It was, I mean, it was kind of humorous almost. So they were not effective against naval targets. They had a pretty good effect though at bombing enemy runways and stuff. So they were able to at least keep the Japanese uh, honest by putting big holes in their runways and things like that. So in a way they had some some effect and and also it was just morale uh right after pearl uh pearl harbor and the fall of the philippines nothing good was happening and the press and american public really needed some good publicity and the the machine the the publicity machine helped these guys uh at least get some recognition and got good headlines in the newspapers and that sort of thing. So beyond the fact that they didn't do much real damage, at least they were good for morale all over the place as far as the United States was concerned, and Australia too. Bruce, you mentioned uh, the Japanese could steer around um, the bombs falling from a B-17. They 
the Japanese Navy had kind of a set of concerns about long range land based bombers early in the war that, that sort of predicated their offensive operations and things up until around the Battle of Midway, um, because it wasn't widely understood on either side that the B-17s were not great at targeting ships and so on. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the sort of evolution of the Japanese response to that kind of attack um, that moved towards, you know, holding runways rather than trying to sink ships? Well, it was, it really was a little bit of, um, to, you know, to use a pun, it was kind of a hit or miss evolution, Keegan, because we were trying to determine, we being the, the B-17 squadron, they were trying to figure out what worked and the Japanese were responding to what they were seeing. And I think everybody was sort of feeling their way around at those in those early months to see what did work. Um, the B-17s really didn't often go after naval targets at sea. They tried during the Battle of Coral Sea with no real success. Um, in fact, the more notorious outcome of the Coral Sea battle was a group of B-17s from the Kangaroo Squadron attacking what they thought was a Japanese task force, and it turned out to be allied. And they came really close to hitting the uh, flagship of the Australian Admiral, who had a fairly sizable fleet uh, out there in the Coral Sea. The, they dug on near hit the uh, HMAS Australia pretty badly, but luckily it, it got a drenching from near misses, but luckily was not hit. But you can imagine the sort of scathing anger and, and messages that flew around after that almost deadly friendly fire incident. Um, so yeah, at Midway, B-17s attempted to bomb naval targets without any real success again. So it just took a while to realize that the Japanese really could get out from under the bombs pretty easily. Uh, just by by looking up, I know that sounds oversimplified, but but that's pretty much what it came down to. Uh, high altitude bombing just didn't work, and that's a, one reason why General Kenny took such a drastic move of figuring out with the aid of Bill Ben, who I mentioned before, how to take the a British technique and literally skip bomb naval targets and they used B-17s not from the kangaroo squadron but other units to literally drop right down to wave top height at night in Rabaul Harbor and skip bomb Japanese ships and later B-25s and uh, A-20s were, done, were used for the same thing very effectively in the Battle of the Bismarck Sea in 1943 but in those cases, again, they went right down on the deck and dropped their bombs at very low altitude and let the bombs literally skip off the surface into the sides of the enemy ships. So that is probably the bigger outcome of this whole um, evolution of trying to figure out how to attack naval shipping with bombers. Bruce, you mentioned a potentially massive friendly fire incident um, relating to the involvement of the Australian Navy and, and so on. Um, you also had mentioned earlier that, you know, there were willing Australian mechanics trying to help with the airplanes, but weren't necessarily trained on that type of aircraft. Um, I think, you know, the Japanese were learning to fight the war, so were we, and so were our allies. Can you maybe speak a little bit about the kind of support that they were able to receive? Were there integrated operations? Could we count on the Australians for fighter escort or anything like that? Or was this really, um, you, you know, just a world away from the type of war that was fought in Europe? The description you just used would be the more accurate one. Uh, here was this squadron no longer with 12 planes even, just with what they could keep airborne, uh, trying to operate out of Townsville and stage out of places like New Guinea and Horn Island up there um, nearer to New Guinea. But again, it was very haphazard. Uh, the Australians could give 
operational support in that um, we were sharing mission planning and personnel at, at the staff level, and then you know ground support personnel down at the at, in the loading and and preparatory level, those kinds of things, you know, like fueling and bomb dump, uh, you know, bomb loading, getting bombs out of the bomb dumps and so forth. They they were very supportive in that way, but there really wasn't much else that the RAAF could do. The Royal Australian Air Force had very little of its own during those days. Um, and as far as fighter escort, there was none. Um, we didn't have anything that could go all the way to Rabaul until the airfields on the other side of the Papua New Guinea Peninsula were captured. And then later when the P-38 Lightnings came out to, excuse me, to the South Pacific in the fall of 1942, we finally had a long range fighter, but that time frame did not overlap with the period when the Kangaroo Squadron was in operation. <clears throat> so for virtually all of their missions, they were flying these very small, haphazard little attempts with a few planes and no escort. So their only defense against the enemy fighters was their own machine gunners. Bruce, uh, there was another B-17 unit operating in the South Pacific at that time facing some of the same sorts of challenges. Can you maybe speak uh, to the 19th Bomb Group and uh, maybe their relationship to, to the Kangaroo Squadron? Did they ever collaborate on attacks or were they just, you know, kind of too distant from one another in, in theater? Well, the, the Kangaroo Squadron actually became part of the 19th Bomb Group about midway through 1942 when it was reorganized um, as the 40th Reconnaissance Squadron sometime around April, March or April. Uh, so they their histories do converge. Um, the 19th was the group that was stationed in the Philippines when the war began. Uh, they lost an awful lot of airplanes in the opening attacks and gradually withdrew uh, down to Australia. Uh, they were not very effective earlier in the war. And in fact, the morale was very bad. And it took a while for the 19th to get reorganized, frankly. <clears throat> but by March, uh, they had gotten enough new airplanes and gotten personnel ready to go. And they did start flying missions out of different fields in Australia. Uh, the 435th stayed at Townsville and were remote from the headquarters of the 19th Bomb Group throughout the rest of 1942. They operated more or less independently as a primarily a reconnaissance squadron with occasional orders to participate in bombing raids after the spring of 1942, whereas the three other squadrons of the 19th Bomb Group were given the primary duty of the the main bombing raids, such as they were, on Japanese targets. Hope that hope that covers your question. I think it does. Uh, we've had a lot of people um, in the chat just kind of sharing family connections and so on to the story of the 19th. And so I think it was right. it's it's helpful just to understand the the relationship of of these two units to one another. Um, we are getting ready to wrap up here as we are reaching the end of the the kind of 20 minutes of questions. Um, but Bruce. One of the challenges that was encountered by land-based bomber units here in Virginia and at Langley Airfield um, was early in the war when they were given a maritime patrol set of responsibilities, and in, in this case, hunting for, Jap uh, for German submarines off the coast of Virginia. Um, they weren't really able to do the job. Uh, they didn't have a lot. The, the Army land-based bombers weren't trained for maritime patrol. They didn't have radios that could connect and communicate with ships uh, operating, you know, at the Navy level down on the surface. Um, and it was actually, you know, well into 1942 before a lot of these kind of operational challenges were sorted out and uh, crews were trained to conduct maritime patrol. Uh, did they face a similar set of challenges out in, in Hawaii when they were performing their maritime patrol mission? Were they just out there flying around hoping to to find someone or kind of how were they managing that process? It, it was a really interesting case of on the job training, Keegan, because you're absolutely right. We, we just didn't have any any precedence 
for that. Um, as I mentioned, we had the 17th ranked Air Force in the world before World War II started. So we were way behind. Um, now, navigators and, and so forth had, were well trained, and my uncle being one of them, they went through the navigation school run by uh, uh, Pan Am over near uh, Miami Beach. And uh, Pan Am had the best aerial navigators in the world in the world uh, by reputation anyway, because they flew the overseas clippers. So the training for overwater navigation and how to determine position from celestial nav and read the wind on uh, the ocean surface and other things really were pretty well taught. But that said, um, the best that they could do in the early days of the war was just send bombers out on these pie-shaped uh, uh, grids, if you will, they would, if you just imagine a radius going out from, say, Hickam Field out to the, out to the west, way out into the Pacific, they might go out 500 miles and then at a certain designated turn point, they would turn to the right or turn to the left 90 degrees and fly maybe 100 miles in a at a right angle to their outbound leg, and then they would turn again and fly a long inbound leg back to Hawaii. And these these flights would take sometimes over 12 hours to complete. And it was all visual. They didn't have anything like radar on the airplanes. So crew people were just using binoculars and looking out windows and openings to see if they spotted a, a ship or uh, uh, maybe a, a snorkel, or not a snorkel, but a, uh, a periscope, um, something like that that might give away a submarine. So it was all low altitude visual searching for hour upon hour, day after day. Um, it was a grind. Um, and they really didn't see much or report much. Um, and some crews ended up even um, running out of gas and having to be rescued. So there were there were a lot of hazards involved with that. Um, and it really didn't accomplish a whole lot, but they had to do it. They had to assume the Japanese were coming or were at least gunning for them with submarines. And, and so the, it had to be done. I think you, uh, you know, you know, you you make a good case for for you know having to use the tools you have available to you. Uh, you know, famously, the the German U-boat commanders out here critiqued uh, those maritime patrol pie slices because they were flown at the same time in the same place every day, and you could set your watch by them. Um, but you know, uh, I think understanding the the challenges we faced early in the war and that transition from being a, you know, really not a, a world ranked air force into to being a, a force to be reckoned with on a global scale, um, is kind of the story that that all these early war experiences tell us. Um, that being said, Bruce, um, it does seem as though you've opened a door for us. Uh, we probably should invite Fred Hagen on to tell us more about the recovery of the airplane. We've got. Uh, just a lot of questions being asked here, and uh, perhaps we'll reach out to Fred and see if that's something he might be interested in doing, uh, if, if folks are interested in, in having that content presented uh, as a webinar. So Bruce, maybe you can connect us uh, as he is a friend of yours. I would love to do that, and I think Fred may be actually uh, in on tonight's webinar just as a, as a guest to see what I'm talking about, and hopefully I've covered it accurately, Fred, if you're listening, but uh, yeah. That would be awesome to set up uh, a webinar with Fred so that he could go into more detail about the extrication of that airplane and all of the ordeals that he went through. Um, I bet he would have uh, Ken Fields join in on that, uh, Ken being the son of one of the pilots. I think tonight uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, Joan Reed might be with us tonight. Her dad was the co-pilot of the B-17 that broke in half burning at Hickam Field on December the 7th. And he went on out with the Kangaroo Squadron. Uh, we have some others who I think may be uh, listening in that I invited just because I knew they had a personal connection. So, yep, you're spot on to try uh, setting up a webinar with Fred and his group. Well, um... 
we will we will send the official invitation and uh, hopefully some some good will come of it. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for your presentation this evening. We we sure appreciate you being with us again. Bruce, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us again. Have a great evening, and uh, we'll hopefully see you out at the museum again soon, or see you on next week's webinar.